Hey everybody, I have kind of a fun video for you today. Uh, well, nerdy fun. Um, this is an overview of how to an RGB mod a consumer grade Sony CRT. I invited Jose from iFix Retro into the office to come work on one of my Sony TVs and really show me how the process is done. Now, this is not a how-to video or a step-by-step -step guide or anything, and to be honest, I really wasn't comfortable doing something like that until I walked through the process at least one or two times, because if you don't discharge properly, it could be really, really dangerous to work on a CRT. So let that be the, the legal disclaimer here. You know, If you don't know what you're doing, you could actually die. So please don't do this unless you know what you're doing. But anyway, um, I just wanted to show the process, show uh, how it looked at the end, and if few of the bumps in the road that we hit because I think it's really beneficial to anybody who was considering doing something like this. Also, I'm really sorry some of the parts got a little bit blurry. I was trying out a new handheld camera, which sucked, so I'll just try using my DSLR next time and use the manual focus, but I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did working on it, and I hope to follow up very soon with an actual how-to guide, and maybe Jose could come back and work on that with me as well, but here you go. Let's start us out. All right, guys, I'm here with Jose Cruz, a.k.a. CruzLink, uh, and we are doing an RGB mod to a TV. So the first thing I really want you to show on camera is how you discharge it, because I well, don't want to die when I do these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it is is, uh, I mean, they tell you the discharge tools cost like 100 bucks, which is crazy expensive. So you can make your own. You just have a board, screwdriver? Um, flathead screwdriver. You can get a longer one if you're somewhat scared. And then once, once you wrap it, you insulate it with a uh, tape and that's it. And then you just put it on I the... hooked up to the metal chassis of these. Usually if you have anything that's metal, like a shelf or anything, you could just hook yeah, it up Yeah, why don't you just that. hook it right up to my 32 inch BDM, see what no. happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's already discharged. For the most part, when I first inserted it before, you hear a little bit of a... A pop? A pop, you know, like a static pop. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's the 20K volts and the anode cap. And that's it? And that's it, it's discharged already. And then it's it's a clip action, so it's a uh, usually a clip. You just undo one side, okay. Do the other two. That's what could sap you and give you an unpleasant. Gotcha. So that's it. So once that's discharged, nothing under here still has a charge in it, right? No. Most of the stuff in here, you have the hot part of the chassis, which is where all the high voltage happens, especially where you got your AC coming in. That's right. The plug. That's all the high voltage. But most of the other stuff, technically so, speaking, like all this, like the daughter boards and the, the stuff like this works on five volts. So yeah, and it's, even it's if, relatively it, safe if it did have it. a charge, you know, you're fine touching it. The, uh, the caps will lose charge after a little bit, so that's not that big a deal. You have some of the AC heat sinks on the other side that they definitely would hold charge uh, for a little charge, bit. But yeah. that's the type of thing where if it's unplugged for 10 minutes, you're but the probably main, yeah, fine. But the main thing is this. What I always do too, um, or at least when it's, uh, the first thing I do after I unplug it <laughs> is hit the power button a couple times. And oh, that yes, usually, that, it, that discharges all of these boards, but that's not a replacement for this. You no, still have to no. do that. That thing holds its charge for a while. And it's not like five or, you know, small voltage. You're talking about like 20K, Yeah. sometimes 30K in the biggest TV, so. And then after that, all you do then basically is uh, I, find the board that you need and. Uh, I'm gonna unplug all the connections that are going to the basically to the chassis so that I could actually pull it completely out. And then I also have to remove this neck board. Usually when you do this, you try to put both hands firmly and that's the neck, so you never want to break the neck. So you just apply even pressure and slowly rock it gotcha. back as you're getting it back. See, that's your neck. And then you unattach anything that's still basically attached to the neck. This is your degaussing coil. So every TV, every tube, whether it's arcade or anything, has a degaussing coil. Every time your TV turns on, that's why you hear zoom. That's basically it degaussing the coil. And as you can see, they did in the fabric, they did some convergence repairs right here. That's why you see a little magnet there. Have you ever heard of the convergence tape? Or the little convergence thing? tape and convergence strips. Um, yeah, it's, it's the hard same to thing. get convergence strips because they don't really make them anymore. But you they're can make little them tape metal things. But well, that's basically it. Just magnets and double-sided tape. They did this in the, in the fabric. They put a little magnet there probably to get better convergence in the corners or whatever. And this right here is your grounding strap. Every monitor has what they call though, a TV, has a grounding strap, which is basically a piece of uh, metal 
that's strapped to the four corners of the chassis and then it supposedly a lot of monitors basically are self discharging when you turn them off but I don't trust that I always discharge it regardless yeah any kind of basic safety practices like that I'm all about so <laughs> trust me I've been I've been zapped so many times for uh, you know for working in open frame power supplies I just I don't I don't like it <laughs> it's not a good feeling no it's not man it's crazy because I have friends tell me that like old like people that work on our keyboards and stuff like that around chassis and stuff they told me that you know the biggest shock they ever got like sometimes their bowels release and <laughs> they shit themselves <laughs> now that's embarrassing yeah <laughs> see and now we could just wire this to the middle of a four pdt switch right and then uh, the other two sides, one side would be your SCAR socket and one side would be the original signal. So those are the inputs of the on-screen display. So when you hit like Basically, the menu yeah. button on your remote, that's, you know, the, they, the, they that signal goes through, yeah. through there. Yeah, one is uh, blanking, then you got your RGB. Gotcha. And then basically what I usually do is like, since I desolder and pull the pins out of circuit, I'll go to these pads and I'll grab the original signal right from the OSD pad. right from the pad. So you're not going to try pulling it from a different location which no, might have had components I'll get between it, I'll it. Get you it get right, it right, yeah, from, right from the source where it was supposed perfect to be. Sense. And then I'll put it on a switch and then you know one flick of the switch would be the original OSD and the other original so operation. Still control and everything then, else. Exactly and then when you flick to the other side it will be your signal plus the five volts for blanking the screen or whatever the hell it is. Awesome. Yeah. Right, the middle, the middle is your common point. Right, and that, that's what goes and out then, to the RGB yeah. sync lines. Yeah, to the... This is basically what goes into the jungle chip. This, um... The middle. The middle. The middle goes to and, the jungle chip. And then one and side... to the blanking pin. Right. One side is your SCART socket. Will be attached to the SCART socket and five volts. The other side will be attached to the original... The original holes on the board. OSD, the original OSD signal. And the original si uh, blanking signal. Gotcha. So then when you flip, one side would be... Your RGB with the SCART socket, and the other side would just be normal OSD from the board or whatever. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So here's where you attach. Uh, now, which lines are all of these? What's uh? Well, um, here you have the five volt foot blanking. Okay. I grabbed it right by the regulator. This is the regulator. Okay. Um, also, right here you have a. Uh, right here you have a uh, where you tap in for audio. So basically to get audio going through, all you're doing is just feeding off the, the regular inputs. So you got your right, uh, your left audio, right, right audio, and your sync. And they're all tapping into a normal input, which is, see? Gotcha. So your sync goes here, and your audio signal goes right there. And it's color coded. I made the freaking 5 volt orange model fuck up and confuse it with somewhere else and plug it in and fuck it up. Alright, that's cool. Now I know a lot of people are very like, eh, hot glue, but the reason I put hot glue in certain points like this, only in certain points is for strain relief. So if an asshole is trying to disconnect this shit. Right, you, got, you, you have to pull, really yank on it in order for that to exactly, come out. Exactly, so then the strain goes to the glue rather than the actual solder point. Right, that's yeah. That's how you pull pads. So I'm pro hot glue, not just like a, a big mess, but just for strain relief. Yeah, well, points. I'm zoomed in pretty deep. I mean, those are two or three and tiny little pads. Same thing here. This is um, this is the actual input card, right? Right here. Yeah. This is your input card. What I did is I pulled up the jungle chips. I pulled them out of circuit. I pulled up uh, brown. As you can see, that's my blanking signal. Okay. And you know, the other ones are self-explanatory, right? You get your blue, your green, and your red going in, and that's that will be in the middle. This corresponds to the middle of the switch, right? Because your switch has the common point, which is the middle. This will be in the middle of your switch. Your DPD, uh, 4 PDT right here. Mm -hmm. Will connect to the middle of the switch. And here you go, your original OSD signal. I tapped into the actual uh, pads, remember? How I lifted those pins? Yep. Now the original signal is still going to those pads, so this will be on the other side of the switch. So once you flick the switch one way, you either have the original signal and normal function which are normal inputs or if you flick the switch the other way then you you're getting your RGB your uh, audio left and right and then also you get the five volts 
which would be connected with this side of the switch. Gotcha. So one side would be blanking and your RGB and the other side would be normal operation. So basically we're just going to throw it back together and hope it all works. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Back to you guys after that. But, um, here's what it all looks like all back together. Um, Jose uses these, uh, you know, uh, the wires DuPont connectors so that easy release, which is way better. And now... Alright, let me just jump in here real quick and explain exactly where we're at in the process. So Jose bolted everything back up, we turned it on, and the SNES picture was shifted all the way over to one side. So there was obviously some adjustments that needed to be made. On top of that, there was a lot of interference in the signal, which we figured out was coming from a bad ground point. So we just shifted it over to a ground point on the video chip itself, figuring that should be clean enough. Both of those fixes worked fine. And then uh, it was very, very bright. So we actually had to turn the brightness of the TV down almost all the way. And while, um, it, while you would think that wouldn't affect the direct RGB mod, it absolutely did. So once we get it back together, um, I'll show you the difference now. You could see what composite video Video looks like so you could see like look for Mario's eyes are all blurry and then you know look at like the lettering in Super Mario World but now check it out in full RGB so this thing is absolutely crystal clear and really 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 awesome so as you can see here uh, here's the finished product of the TV itself I think it looks absolutely awesome. Um, we had Ben from iFix Retro come in and cut the hole, so it looks pretty much factory. Um, you can see the toggle switch right there that toggles between the on-screen display and the actual RGB SCART input. And, uh, I mean, overall, I just think it's absolutely awesome. And pictures can't really do it justice. Um, I'll throw a comparison picture up right now so people could see the differences. But once again, I mean, it's something that you really need to see in person in order to understand. Um, my personal thoughts on this, now this is just an opinion, is that if I had seen one of these before I had seen a PVM or a BVM, uh, I don't think I would have felt the need to go out and get one of those. Now, of course, when you're lucky enough to see them side by side, you do see a difference. The more lines in the professional video monitors or the broadcast video monitors do make a sharper picture. And, I mean, let's be honest, that's what they were designed to do. The PVMs were very often in medical imaging places, so for seeing things like MRIs and X-rays, you need as sharp uh, and as high resolution a monitor as possible. And same thing with the BVMs, you know, you have studios calibrating high-end movies on these things, so they needed to be precision instruments, which is why they cost so much money. But, I mean, seeing a consumer-grade TV like this, I mean, it looks just like an arcade monitor. It was really crystal clear. Um, you know, I, I'm, I might sound like I'm trying to play it up, but the truth is I'm just trying to express my shock at how impressed I was. Um, you know, I'd seen pictures online before. Mike Moffat used to post his pictures. And while it looks great, it, there's just... I mean, unless you see it with your own eyes, there's absolutely no comparing them. So I'm going to keep doing more videos like this. The next video that I really, really want to do, which I might even do before the how-to guide, is I want to take one consumer-grade TV that has all the inputs, RF, composite, S-video, component, and add RGB to it as well, so that I could actually do comparisons of a modded SNES console, you know, with flawless video output across each input so people could really see what the differences are all on the same monitor and then i'll do the same on a pvm as well just so you could see how it compares you know uh composite s video component and um uh in direct rgb so we could, people could really see if this process is necessary or maybe you should just grab a tv that has component video inputs and use those i honestly don't know the answer to that yet which is why i'm so excited to to make that video uh you know this is really exciting stuff for me because in my opinion you know these consumer grade TVs are going to be available for a while, but these PVMs and BVMs are going to start to get scarce a lot quicker than consumer grade TVs. So to be able to do stuff like this, and then maybe someday down the line, uh, we'll be able to make videos on how to take high quality consumer TVs and use them as arcade monitors. Jose just did that for Brooklyn video games. And you know, there's just really endless possibilities to the work we could do with these things. We just need more people educated with CRT repair 
in, in mods like this. So, um, you know, I, any thoughts or feedback, please post down below. I am by no means an expert on this, so I don't know if I'd be able to answer some of the more technical questions, at least yet. I'm, uh, I'm getting there. But definitely give me your thoughts and feedback. Um, like I said, this was just a fun overview video. Uh, next time I'll do a lot more in-depth stuff, so please let me know what you guys like to see. And as always, I'll see you guys next time.